caught you, you're right. Welcome to Fellowship of Joy. We're going to begin with the reading of Scripture. Rowan, would you like to come forward, please, and read Scripture for us? Give me my Scripture. That's up here. Fudge down. Show us your continuous love, O Lord, and give us your saving help. I am listening to what the Lord God, He has promised peace to us, His own people, if we do not go back to our foolish ways. Surely He is ready to save who honors Him and, sa and save Saving presence with remaining in our land. Dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your saving presence. We thank you for your peace. We want to be your people. We want to be people who choose to follow you. people who love you. We want to be people who share your love with those around us. We pray that this morning's service will bring honor and glory to you. We love you, Lord Jesus, as we pray in Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You are 
Announcements, that's what we do next. <laughs> okay, good job, Rowan, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, next Sunday. Next Sunday we have a special guest. Angeline's coming back to preach for us next Sunday, so, okay. Okay. Well, you can watch us. That's easy, Carolyn. You can watch us on Facebook Live or on fellowshipofjoy.ca. Yes. Okay, so you can you can watch us there. That, uh, that'll be up in the afternoon, though. We're, we're live on Facebook, and then in the afternoon we we post it to fellowshipofjoy.ca. Okay. Also, every evening at eight thirty, Ron and I do a moment of joy. Currently, we're reading through the Book of Acts. So if you want a a Bible study on the Book of Acts, we read through it. Rowan asks questions sometimes. And if anybody else has any questions, they can actually write them in the comments and we'll try and address them as we go. So that's every night at 8.30. On Wednesday the 19th at 6 p.m. on 89 East Quarter Line, we're having a community corn roast. Invite all your friends. Talk to everybody you know because I ordered way too much corn. The corn's ordered. I'm not canceling any. What's that? We're having a corn roast. Over at uh, Grandma and Papa's, 89 East Quarter Line. So, so I've got 10 dozen. I'm joking. 10 dozen? Yeah, we got 10 dozen ears of corn, so bring your friends. All right. Or an appetite, whatever you got first. And bring an appetite. We'll probably get some hot dogs, too. I don't think we need any salads because we'll have corn and hot dogs and that sort of thing. I'll clean out the hot dogs for you. And I think that's it for announcements, unless anybody else has any. No music this Wednesday. It's next Wednesday. No music this Wednesday. It's next Wednesday. Did you hear that, Jackie? So the music... No, that won't work. Doug, so the music will be at the corner. Yes, the music will be at the corner. Oh. Okay, so, cool. yeah, we planned the corner roast on a music night, like we did last year. Okay. Right? So we might, we might have music. Bob, if you want to bring your music, you can bring your music. I might bring my guitar. I might not. We'll see how it goes. So. Everybody wants music. Come on. All right, fine. We'll bring the music. Uh, speaking of music, let's sing these. Uh, these are the days of Elijah. Out the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of the servant Moses, righteousness being restored. I know these are days of great trials, a famine and darkness and souls. Still hear the voice in the desert. Crying, prepare the way of the world. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Hear the trumpet call, so lift your voice. You should believe how the science hill salvation comes. Of course, again, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Hear the trumpet call, so lift your voice, hear it you believe, how does science hear salvation come? These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as wet. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding the temple of grace. These are the days of the harvest, the fields are as ripe as the world, and we are the laborers in the yard, declaring the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, hear the trumpet call, so lift your voice, hear it to the leaves, out of silence. Salvation comes, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, 
clouds shining like the sun. Hear the trumpet call, so lift your voice. Hear a jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Out of Zion's hill, salvation All right, so what are we thankful for this week? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Right on. Getting a what? Yeah. Oh, that's right, the Praise cat. Lord. Sweet. And how do we see God at work this week? Oh. Well, I found pickles this week. You did. Hallelujah for that. We couldn't find them anywhere. No? No. I see them but I didn't them So what is Jesus asking you to do this week? What's that? What is Jesus asking you to do this week? To be patient. <laughs> exactly. That, that, that's Take true. away the, the virus. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be our prayer request for this week. Is to there be any other patient at work. Week? Patience at work. Well, maybe that's what Jesus is asking you to do, is be patient at work. That's what I mean. And at home, too, Don. And at home. <laughs> <laughs> and how's your soul? What's that? How is your soul? And actually, can I mean, I'm happy with the decision to go back to school. I know a lot of people aren't. I know a lot of people are scared. Rowan's yeah. excited to go back. Maybe we can just pray for the people who are organizing that and that okay. they will do have wisdom and do the right things. And... Okay. I don't know. I think we should. Uh... Except in January, that'd be nice. Well, no, it's going to be uh, extremely cold for winters and a lot hotter in the summer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, pray that those uh, ice cats melt don't melt in the winter. Yeah. 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 All right. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you give us. We know that you're in control. You're in control of the weather and you're in control of our lives. We pray that we honor you. We know that you've made us stewards of your creation and, and, and we've messed up and we've, we've destroyed when we should have built up. We pray that we'd be better stewards, better stewards of our resources and better stewards of our natural resources as well. We pray that we look after what you have provided us with. We pray that we don't waste and we don't use more than we need, but we use what we need to bring honor and glory to you. We pray for our leaders. They're making tough decisions right now. They're making decisions about what to go forward with the school and what classes will look like. We pray that as they seek wisdom in these decisions, when they truly seek wisdom, they will find you. We pray that this has an effect on them. We pray for opportunities to share your love and your wisdom with our leaders. We pray for opportunities to be salt, to be light, to be a witness and to carry your message to those around us. We praise you, Lord, for what you can do, what you have done, and what you're about to do. You're a mighty God, and we look forward to seeing you move. So we pray in Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, Bob's going to do Church in the Wildwood for us.
This is uh, the time. Rowan, if you want, in the, uh, in my boat, there's a, 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 a net. Okay, I just, if you want to stay six feet away. Yeah. Uh -oh. At this point. Well, yeah. Rowan. So, yeah, this is the time when we would uh, take up the offering. If you're watching at home and you'd like to donate to our work, you can uh, go to fellowshipwithjoy.ca and on the top there's a banner that says Tithely. You can donate that way. Or if you're just uh, a debit person like me and you don't use cash, you can always donate using debit on Tidely. Uh, or you can go to our, our, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can go to the Shop Now button and donate to our work that way as well. Okay, um, I'm gonna pray. You know, as I was sitting over there, I was standing, when Bob was singing, I was standing over there looking at the flowers. I was thinking back how I used to get up early, about 6.30 on Sunday mornings and go cut wildflowers to put in the church. But here we don't even have to cut them, they're just here. And, and, and not only are they just here, but if you look, there's about half a dozen bees, three different species. And it's just beautiful that God provides not only the flowers, but the pollinators for the rest of the garden there too. So, yeah. so we're going we're gonna to praise God by giving to his work now. Dear Lord Jesus, we, we, we come to you with our offerings. We come to you pleased to be able to give back to your work. We pray that you use these gifts to grow your church. And, and, and yeah, we know that, that you're a God who has everything and needs nothing. And yet you accept our, our gifts. 
And we praise you for that. You accept our gifts as, as sacrifices of praise. And we pray that we pray that we give in a way that honors you. We pray that we give out of love and a passion for your work. This we pray in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Praise God for There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also anoint Jeru. Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from Ab Abel Mahalo, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the word of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the word of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and I will come with you. To the end of the chapter. That's not what you... He's really into it. Okay. That's not what you... Romans 10. Romans 10, 5 to 15. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you are 
that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. ago, it wasn't that long ago, but one of the things we used to do together was we used to go to theaters, well I didn't because I'm not a big fan of theaters, but some people did, do ya? Alright, but uh, when you go to a theater you watch a movie and, and, and my favorite kind of movies were um, the ones with like unexpected twists. You know, you think you know what's coming next, and out of nowhere, something totally unexpected happens. Example? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like watching a Randy Orton fight. Just boom, out of nowhere. You never know that RKO is going to come. And that's how it goes with, with a lot of sports. Um, 
you just don't know what it's going to happen. That's what makes them exciting. I remember years ago, uh, ProLine had an ad, and the tagline was like something, you never know what's going to happen, or something along those lines, because they had like a seagull that caused a blimp to crash, that caused some sort of unexpected touchdown or something. I don't know what was going on. I don't know football. But anyways, anything could happen in these games, and that was the tagline. Well, the truth is, here in 2020, anything can happen. We have no idea what to expect this year. And I'll admit, I have no clue what I'm doing up here this morning. I'm supposed to be here leading this fellowship, and I don't have any answers for you. I don't know what the future will bring. All I know is that I am trusting Jesus. And that's all I can do. Because I don't have a clue what the fall is going to bring. This past Wednesday, we planned to meet with, with a group of area ministers. And we plan to pray and to make plans for the future. And and so instead of meeting in a, a room in Port Rowan like we normally did, we met here because people were afraid to meet in a, a closed space, so we come to the gazebo. And we came to play to pray and to plan for the future. Well, we prayed. But there wasn't a whole lot of planning going on. Because anything can happen in twenty twenty. We don't know how to plan for what's next because we don't know what will be allowed or what people will be comfortable doing. And and we noticed that, that there was different groups. Different, some churches were really excited to start meeting outdoors and meeting in groups again and, and having joint services, and other churches are afraid to even meet at all yet. So we don't know where, where the comfort level is going to be. So it's really hard to plan something together when we're all over the map. So we pray and trust Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to pray with your leaders and trust Jesus this morning. And my guess is that if you've been part of this fellowship for any period of time, you're used to that. See, continuity and security are not words to describe the church planning experience, and especially not words that describe our experience. We're just not used to knowing what to do. We're used to praying, what's next, Jesus? Sometimes this is really exciting, and sometimes it's terrifying. Sometimes it's frustrating or disheartening. See, God is unpredictable. God does what God wants. He doesn't consult with human beings. That is why we are called to follow God. I've told the story many times, and we, we need to keep telling it because it's our story. The story belongs to everybody here. See, three years ago, a group of Christians met in this house and prayed for vision. And out of that meeting, we decided that God was calling us to plan a church. And we didn't have a name for the church, and we didn't have a place to meet. We didn't have a plan at all, but God said, follow my lead, so we did. And the next morning standing, because I couldn't get phone service in the house, I'm standing right next to that canoe right there, I call Wendy, cook, to book the community center for a Christmas dinner. We had five adults at that time, and two ten-year-old children. And we were committing to host a Christmas dinner with no money, and no name, and nothing but faith in Jesus to lead us. And that was in April. And we didn't meet the following Sunday morning. In fact, we didn't meet on a Sunday morning until July. And when we did, we met at Bacchus Mill, and we knew we only could have that space for about 10 weeks maximum. Second week of September, we knew we were out of there. But we didn't know where we were going to go. But we would follow Jesus. Those of you that were there might not know this. Maybe you do. But we actually signed the lease for the classroom of the school and picked up the key the first morning we met the school. We didn't even have a key or a lease. We arrived in faith following Jesus. That December, we put on the Christmas dinner for 150 people, and we were excited. And the future, we're, we couldn't wait to share the joy of the Lord with our community and serve Jesus by serving our neighbors. And, and that's what we did. And in fact, at that Christmas dinner, I shared that mission statement for the very first time. The wording was a little different because we hadn't worked it out yet. I think it said share the joy of the Lord with St. Williams. 
They served Jesus by serving you, but that was the gist of it. The Fellowship of Joy had a vision and a mission and a regular place to meet. And we shared Jesus in Turkey with our, com with our community. And I was super stoked for Sunday morning. I was thinking, oh man, if this keeps up, we're going to outgrow this classroom in no time and we'll be in the gym and then we'll need a new space. And then that Sunday morning, there was an ice storm. And Jessica came with her two daughters. And my parents came and that was it. That's all that came. The only reason Jessica came is because her church was closed. She couldn't get in. <laughs> and we prayed. And we praised Jesus. And we had a sermon, but we mostly prayed and praised Jesus. Then we went home. And as we packed up the stuff and we put the chairs away, and I had put up way too many chairs because I was convinced there was going to be 150 people there that Sunday. I was a little disappointed. I felt defeated. I was questioning if we really were called to plant a church. We had acted in faith. We had seen God work. We had had this great experience. We were building momentum. We were excited for the future. And then on Sunday... A Sunday that I had looked forward to for six months. We had less people than we started with. And none of the original people that met in that room. But that's why it's called following Jesus. Because we don't know what happens next. We trust Jesus to lead us. And then you know what? The next week, Bob and Nancy showed up. And that was the beginning of real organic growth within our community. That was the, when we started to actually become a church in St. Williams. And I realized that God wasn't going to take us from 7 to 150 in one week. But God has taken us from 7 to 14 to 30. We've had Sundays over 40 and we've had Sundays with less than 10. And in 2020 anything can happen. This morning, Heidi read to us from 1 Kings chapter 19. In this passage, Elijah was hiding in a cave in the mountain of Horeb. He was there because God told him to be there. He didn't know why. He had traveled 40 days and 40 nights to get there, and there was no reason for him to be there except that he was following God. But in order to understand what's going on in this passage, you have to understand some of what is going on in Elijah's life prior to this. See, Elijah was a prophet in Israel. Well, Ahab and Jezebel were on the throne. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, if you've read 1 Kings, you'll know that Ahab and Jezebel were evil, evil people, especially Jezebel. And they're on the throne. So you got evil leaders, evil king and queen in Israel. And Elijah was preaching the word of God in a country that had rejected God. See, Israel had been chosen by God. They had at one time been the people of God. Israel was God's country. But they said no. They said we reject God. We reject our past. We reject our backwards culture, that fairy tale invisible man in the sky that the old people seem to think is real, or at least they pretend in front of us. We reject all that nonsense. We want a God we can see. We don't want old-fashioned rules and old-fashioned values. We don't want to do what God tells us to do. We don't want to live the way that God tells us to live. We want Baal. Because Baal says that we can eat whatever we want, even if it's unclean. Baal says we can drink whatever we want. In fact, Baal says that you honor me when you get drunk. That was how you praise Baal. You got drunk. Not only did you get drunk, but you did a lot of other things you shouldn't have done. That's how you praise Baal. God says be faithful to your spouse. God's perfect plan is a man and a woman married for life. Baal celebrates debauchery. In fact, when we go to the Baal temple, there are male and female prostitutes in the temple because you honor God, or not honor God, you honor Baal by doing, by being, doing what's pleasurable for you. And the king and the queen worship Baal and they tell the rest of their country to worship Baal. And they say, we don't need your old-fashioned God with your old-fashioned values. We want to do what we want to do. And I'm wondering, does that sound familiar? 
today. Have we ever heard that? We don't want that old-fashioned God with old-fashioned value that those old-fashioned old fogies listen to. We want to do what we want to do our way. We want to eat what we want to eat and drink what we want to drink and party the way we want to party. So Elijah, the prophet of God, is speaking to the people that have rejected God. And he sets up a test on Mount Carmel, where 450 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Ashtoreth that ate at Jezebel's table, 900 prophets with special access to the queen show up on Mount Carmel. A special mountain in Baal worship. This is Baal's mountain. And God proves that he is real. He sent fire from heaven, and he proved that he alone is the true God. And Elijah has the people capture and slaughter these false prophets. Elijah then prophesies to King Ahab that the drought that they've been suffering is going to end. And Elijah is seeing God at work. And Elijah is seeing God do mighty things. And things are going pretty good for Elijah. He's demonstrated the power of God. He's acting in faith. He's seeing God at work. And he's likely expecting to see a great revival as the people return to God. But instead, Jezebel decides she's going to kill him. And the people turn on Elijah. And Elijah gets scared and he runs away. And he runs so far that he collapses underneath a broom tree. And he prays for his own death. And he falls asleep. He passes out in exhaustion. I'm wondering, have you ever been there? You see God at work. You're excited that you're doing what you're called to do. You have an idea of what you think God is about to do. But instead, people reject your message. They reject God. Because they want to do what they want to do. In our, in, our message, in our meeting this week, Pastor Bill Weeb said something that really struck me. He said, in our current situation, fear is a virtue. If you're willing to lead, to be bold, people will accuse you of being insensitive. People will actually accuse you of wanting to kill people because you want to meet together. So apparently, you know, you're going to kill them. And I've been accused of this because I will not be ruled by fear. I will continue to worship God. And there are people who have accused me of hate because of that. Especially online. Lots of people say that I, I hate a lot of people. I don't know if you knew this or not, but apparently I, I, I hate the elderly people. Did you know that? And that's what they tell me online. They tell me that I hate anybody with a compromised immune system. I didn't know that. But if that's true, I, I should probably get a better job because, you know, working in healthcare, that's a, that's a terrible place to be if you hate everybody that you see. But lots of people on, online tell me how much I hate people because I, I don't think that people should be told that they can't meet together. I think that playground equipment should be open so kids can play outside and get fresh air and sunshine and vitamin D. The problem is our society right now, fear is considered a virtue. And if you're bold, you're trying to kill people. Think about how stupid that is. But it's not a surprise, because that's what the devil does. He twists things. He tells lies. The devil exists to take the people away from the truth. The devil will always twist the truth to keep people from Jesus. That's the real reason why you can go to Walmart, but you can't go to church. You know, if I say that the family is ordained by God... And it's good to have a mother and a father to raise children. Then obviously I, I hate people that have an alternate relationship. I mean, it couldn't possibly be true that it's actually good for children to have two parents. It couldn't possibly be true that I can have friends and family that I love and pray for. And who are, who are tempted in, in different ways. But I still love them and I don't hate them. I love them and I want best for them. what's best for them and what's best for their children. To be raised by a mother and a father. But that's love. That's not hate. But the world says it's hate because it says that I am intolerant of alternative lifestyles. But then I ask, when did tolerance become a virtue? 
Seriously, what is virtuous about putting up with something? What is virtuous about saying nothing, about being too cowardice to stand up for anything? I mean, do you tolerate a little bit of cancer? How much cancer do you allow in your body? Seriously, patience is a virtue. Resilience is a virtue. Endurance is a virtue. Tolerance is not a virtue. Think about it this way. You got two friends, okay? You got something on your face. Some food, I don't know, spaghetti or something. Who knows what you eat. But you're eating something and you got food on your face. And one person doesn't want to embarrass you by telling you that. You got food on your face. So they tolerate it. They say nothing and they go on and you go on with your day. But the second person sees the food on your face and gently lets you know. They just go, and then, you know, you got food on your face. Who's the better friend? Who actually cares about you? Who is showing compassion and love so you don't go around embarrassing yourself all day with someone on your face? A true friend shows compassion and love, and only someone who doesn't care shows tolerance. Tolerance is literally not caring. How is not caring a virtue? It isn't, but the devil says it is. The world says it is. It's those people who've rejected God, who've rejected Jesus, who don't want to hear the joy of the Lord because they've chosen temporary pleasure of sin. They say, tolerate my sin. Don't point it out to me. I don't want to know. I don't want to know that I have food on my face or, or a booger hanging out of my nose. I'm happy the way I am. But tolerance is not love. Tolerance is not an expression of care. It's an expression of not caring at all. So first the devil convinced Canada that tolerance is a virtue, and now he's trying to convince us that fear is a virtue. We're being told that if we care about people, we won't go to church. If we care about people, we won't plan to serve Thanksgiving meals. If we really love people, we better cancel Christmas. If you care about someone, you better stay at home and die alone in the dark with a mask on so you don't make anybody else sick. But Elijah was accused of the same thing. He was accused of hitting his people because he preached the word of God. He preached repentance from sin. He told people to follow God, not Baal. He saw God at work, but the people rejected his message. He was discouraged. He was scared. He was ready to give up. He runs away and falls asleep under a tree. And God sent an angel to feed him. The angel wakes him up. He eats. Then he falls back to sleep. Then after a time, the angel came back. He said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. And he ate again, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights. So that's how Elijah got in the cave. In case you were wondering how we got into the cave. And the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Think about that. <laughs> Why, why, why am I here? Because you told me here. It seems like a very strange question. He was there because God told him to go there. Why else would he be in a cave in Horeb? But that's why it's called following God. Sometimes Jesus will take you places and you don't know why you're there. I never wanted to and never would have thought back when we were planning this three years ago that we would be meeting on this porch in this yard. Why are we here? We're here because we're following Jesus. We're here because we're not going to stop meeting just because we can't find a place to meet. We will always find a place to meet to praise Jesus. We're here because in 2020 anything can happen. And God asked Elijah, why are you here? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And they're trying to kill me too. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you've been used by God? You've seen God at work? You've been really zealous for the Lord God Almighty? And instead of Jesus doing what you'd expect it, what you'd hope for, instead of people responding in prayer and repentance, instead of seeing a revival, 
Instead of people saying, thank you for pointing out that sauce on my face, you feel rejected and attacked. You're exhausted. You're ready to give up. I'll admit I've been there a few times. I felt like giving up on this fellowship of joy thing, especially with all these rules and stuff in the place. There are times when I get tired of telling people that Jesus loves you. Because more often than not, the response is a middle finger or some expletive. And I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. You're excited to share the joy of the Lord with your friends or family and they reject your message and they reject Jesus and they take it out on you. Maybe you don't pray for death like Elijah did. Maybe, maybe you just kind of give up a little bit. Skip your devotions. Get a little lazy in your following. Skip church a week or two. Maybe you do pray for death. I, I, I don't know. But the thing is, Jesus has never done what people expect. His disciples expected him to build a kingdom on earth. But we don't understand the things of God. It's impossible for us to fathom an all-knowing, eternal, and perfect God. So how can we possibly predict what this God is about to do? But we're not called to lead God. We're called to follow Jesus. We're called to follow Jesus. And you can question me all you want. I'm just a human being like you. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like you. And you can question the church, and that's fine, and that's a good thing. And if nobody questioned the church, there'd be a lot of heresy being taught in a lot of places. And you can pray and question God. And He will answer you through His Word, the Bible, and through a word from another believer, or in any way that God sees fit. We're allowed to question God. But we're called to follow Jesus. Back in March when this, this whole lockdown thing came, if you listen to the CBC, the message over and over again was, uh, don't question the doctors. Don't question the leaders. They know what you're doing. This will be a short time. And just follow the rules. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's a pretty big red flag when the government says, don't question what I'm doing. Anytime anybody tells me not to question authority, I automatically assume that they're up to something. And I will always question human authority. And I will follow Jesus. Elijah didn't know why God had taken him to the mountain. He knew he'd been zealous for God. And the people he preached to had not responded. He knew he was in a cave because God called him to be there, but he didn't know why. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. It's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. When we think of God, we think of power. We think of strength. And here's a wind that is literally moving mountains. Isn't that how you expect God to show himself? That's how I would imagine God at least. But God was not in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came fire. Now if I was Elijah, I would fully expect that God would be in that fire. What was it? 40, 41, 42 days ago? Who knows? Elijah had just seen God send fire from heaven. Consume the altar and the sacrifice and the very rocks that it was on. Elijah had experienced the power of God in fire, but God was not in the fire. God doesn't show himself in the way we expect. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard this, he pulled his cloak over his face. He went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, What are you doing here? Elijah recognized the Lord in a quiet whisper. God doesn't shout at us. 
Jesus does not force himself into anyone's life. God speaks through the quiet whisper. You have to want to hear God. Elijah recognizes God in the quiet whisper. He covers his face. And he goes out to the mouth of the cave to hear from God. Elijah covered his face in humility. Elijah covered his face because he was not worthy to be in the presence of God. Do you approach Jesus with reverence and respect? None of us is worthy to be in the presence of God. We are only made worthy through the blood of Jesus. Elijah has been called by God to hear God. But he's still humble before God. And he goes out to hear what God speaks to him. And then the voice said to him, again, this verse repeats itself. What are you doing here, Elijah? And again, Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altar, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord said, go back the way you came from. Go to the desert. Anoint a new king in Aram. A new king over Israel. Anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. God had brought Elijah 40 days journey. Quite possibly 40 days of fasting, I, I would imagine so. Because he ate what the angel gave him and it said that it gave him strength. So for 40 days, Elijah traveled to a mountain. He goes up in the mountain in a cave. And God asks him why you're here. And then he tells him, go back to where you came from. Sometimes God will have you travel 40 days in one direction just to turn you around and send you back where you were before. Go back to the desert. See, God told Elijah, I am in control. God chooses kings and prophets. We don't have to know the future. We are called to follow Jesus. This morning, how do you read to us from Romans 10? If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When you feel like giving up, when you're tired and scared and discouraged, when you don't understand what God is doing, or why he's asking you to do the things that he's called you to do. When you don't feel like sharing the joy of the Lord with your community. When you don't feel like coming to church. When you don't feel like serving Jesus by serving your neighbors. Or you don't know how because you can't rent a hall. Or do the things that you normally do. Be encouraged. Because if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's what God requires you to do. Do you believe? Then let's declare it together. Jesus is Lord. Let's say it together. Jesus is Lord. Now let's say it with passion. Jesus is Lord. Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Do you actually believe that in your heart? That God raised Jesus from the dead? Then you're saved. There's only one thing left to do. You're called to follow Jesus. You're called to share that message. You're called to share the joy of the Lord with your community. Romans 10, 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's very encouraging. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are no special people. There's no one that can't be saved. And there's no one that is so special that God chose them to be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they've never heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We're all called to share that message. We're all called to let people know that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We don't always know what God is, is, is going to do. Or how God is going to call us to deliver that message. And even while I was sitting 
down on Thursday morning writing this sermon, I received a phone call from Norfolk County telling us that we can't use the community center for Joy Kids in September. We might and may not be able to use it in October. And even if we can rent it in October, there's going to be a large additional cost for deep cleaning. And I, I don't know where that money is going to come from. I don't know where the, what the future is going to bring. But I do know that I am called to share the joy of the Lord with our community and to serve Jesus by serving our neighbors. But I don't know what it's going to look like in the fall. And I don't know where we're going to be meeting when it gets too cold to meet in this front yard. But I do know that we are called to follow Jesus. At this moment, I am waiting on Jesus to tell us where he's leading. And I am trusting in Jesus and I am listening for that quiet whisper. Confident that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Convinced that I need to share the message and preach the word boldly. Not fear. Not intolerance. But encourage. Answering God. Not answering the human authority. In 2020, anything can happen. And I will continue to follow Jesus. Will you? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we don't know what you want us to do. You might take us 40 days into the desert in order to have us turn around and walk 40 days back. You might have us feel we're alone when really you've got 7,000 other Christians praying with us somewhere. We don't know what you want us to do. But we're willing to follow you. We know that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and we want to share that message with as many people we can in the way that honors you. We'll continue to meet here until you tell us to meet someplace else. And then we'll continue to meet there until you send us someplace else because that's been our journey. We will follow where you lead. We pray that you help us to grow spiritually. We pray that you give us the spiritual food that we need for the journey. We pray for the rest and the nourishment that we need. That we, we pray that we get into your word. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fill us so we recognize your quiet whisper. Pray for wisdom and strength and guidance. You're a great and holy God. So we pray in Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We've been crying ever since. And then the second time, there was a snowstorm that comes to my back door and knocks on it. I have to, and my first thing goes on mine, Eddie. There is a bond of a snowman if I kept it to myself. Because it's all covered with snow. <laughs> and then, six months later, six months later, he baptized me. And then you guys are stuck with me ever since. Yeah. So we've been crying for a while. Pray for Doug then. We've, no, we no, we got to praise God for that testimony. That, that's exactly what that is. And that's exactly what a testimony is. And we praise the Lord for Thank, thank you for sharing that word, Bob. In your Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's eyes and made, I see.
see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power to well The universe dispel Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee O oh, great Thou art how oh, great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How oh, great thou art How oh, great thou art When and when I think That God is Son not sparing Send him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. said all authority and in heaven and on earth has been given me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything i have commanded you and surely i am with you always to the very end of the age amen You have to help pack up. I know. I don't know who you were. No. Did you finish your food?